Until the middle of the 20th century, a roast on the table was still considered a sign of prosperity. Major advertising campaigns let it be known that meat is a piece of vitality. Today, meat is one thing primarily, a cheap, mass-produced article that anyone can afford. The unimaginable amount of 250 million tons of meat are roasted, grilled, made into sausage, and consumed annually for the sake of the desires of the palate. This has drastic consequences for the climate, the environment, the animals, but also for us human beings. From a nutritional point of view, meat, depending on what kind, consists of 10% fat, about 20% protein, and about 70% water. In addition, it contains iron, potassium, and sodium, as well as the vitamins A, B, D, and K. Thus, substances that our organism needs to live. But does this automatically mean that eating meat is healthy? People think that meat is a staple food. To eat a piece of meat, an animal has to be killed first. That's a job. That's work and nothing else. No feelings. Basically, it's true that with the normal consumption of meat, even when eating high-quality meat, there are always substances consumed that are harmful to health. In contrast to other foodstuffs, meat is a carcass, a piece of carcass. Meat is always a product taken from living fellow creatures. When we die, our flesh becomes rigid. That's the so-called rigor mortis. And after some time, it softens again. With meat, we call this aging. This means that it becomes edible. Generally, meat is considered fresh when it is sold over the butcher's counter. In 1950, 26 kilos of meat were eaten annually per person. Today, it's over 60 kilos in Germany. Can such an increase remain without consequences? Dr. Anne-Marie Grobe is confronted daily with diet-related illnesses. More and more people come with cardiovascular diseases, high blood pressure, excess weight, or diabetes mellitus. Joint and tumor diseases are also increasing, and this despite modern medicine. Interestingly, the illnesses increase with the increase of meat consumption. The thought that meat is necessary for human health was scientifically disproved long ago. Over the past decades, very many epidemiological studies have been conducted that demonstrate that eating meat is correlated with many diseases. These are the major diseases of modern civilization, such as cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, excess weight, gout, cancer. Perhaps another example. In December 2010, the results of a Swedish study were published and there it could be proven that the risk of stroke in women is correlated with eating meat. Dr. Hans Gunther Kugler is the head of a micronutrient laboratory. 
One of his books is entitled Forget Illness, Eat Vegetarian. Meanwhile, it is known that the diseases of affluence cause about 30% of all expenditures in the health system with a rising tendency. Eating meat is connected to weight increase. The fact is that people are getting fatter and fatter. The World Health Organization estimates that about 1.7 billion people are overweight and that obesity is a primary risk factor for type 2 diabetes. And accordingly, the number of diabetics is rapidly increasing. Presently, there are approximately 285 million diabetics. Eating meat is certainly an important risk factor for this disease. Professor Klaus Leitzmann has researched the effects of our diet on illness and health for decades. The director emeritus of the Institute for Nutritional Science in Gießen, Germany, is the author of various textbooks, including standard works on human nutrition. When you take animal foodstuffs as a whole, you can determine that, in part, they do contain unfavorable substances for our present lifestyle. This means that cholesterol is found only in animal foodstuffs. Saturated fatty acids are found primarily in animal foodstuffs. As a rule, and on the average, we find more purine in animal foodstuffs, which ultimately can lead to gout via the metabolism, etc. In my medical practice, I often see a connection between joint diseases and a high consumption of meat. Joint pain leads to people having to take a lot of pain pills, or often they can only walk with crutches or the help of a walker. There are more than 100 studies that deal with the question of how eating meat affects the frequency of tumors, and this is best verified in connection with rectal and colon cancer. Thus, we see that the amount of meat, that is, the daily amount, determines the risk, so to speak. A second important type of tumor is stomach cancer, and it has been established that the consumption of 100 grams of meat per day can increase the risk for stomach cancer by a factor of five. Argentina and Uruguay are some of the largest producers of beef in the world. And precisely these countries report the highest rates of breast and intestinal cancer. This is no proof, but an indication. Dr. Hans Gunther Kugler explains possible causes. There are various substances that promote tumor growth. For example, heme iron promotes free radicals, and free radicals damage the DNA. Then there are compounds called heterocyclic aromatic amines, which develop, for instance, through the grilling, frying or roasting of meat. And these compounds then lead to mutations in the genetic makeup which can, in turn, cause cancer. Meat as a risk factor for tumors, gout, and diabetes. Eating meat can also have a negative influence on our cognitive performance. There are indications that eating meat is also correlated with the risk for a morbus Alzheimer's disease. We can say that at least it has been determined that on the average people with dementia ate more meat than people who did not develop dementia. And so, from a medical point of view, we can say that the statement meat is a piece of vitality is reckless, if not absurd.
As before, the demand for meat is increasing by leaps and bounds. Presently, 250 million tons are consumed worldwide every year. By the year 2050, this number is supposed to double. That's the prognosis of the World Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO. Henning Steinfeld is the director of the sector of livestock production politics. The increase in demand for meat is driven by increases in population growth. However, meat in particular is unsuited for feeding the growing world population. The increases in meat has to come from animals f which you feed with um, cereals mostly and other concentrates. And the conversion of these feeds into meat is usually not very efficient. You, there's a loss. So this is becoming, uh, this has got to the extent that about one third of the total cereal harvest is used for uh, animal feeding right now. In order to produce one calorie in the form of meat, up to 30 calories of vegetable foods have to be used as feed. In the process, a major part of its nutritional energy is lost via the animal metabolism. With cattle, it is over 90 percent. Without this detour via the animal stomachs, the hunger of about 10 times as many people could be satisfied with the same amount of soya and grains. The increase in meat consumption drives up prices. And prices, uh, these high prices, uh, mean that uh, food is less accessible to the poor. Six sheep, eight cows, 25 rabbits, 33 pigs, and 720 chickens. That's the number of animals the average European eats over the course of his life. To feed these animals, grain and soya are imported from countries like Brazil and Argentina. That is, from countries where their own population struggles with poverty. The former UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, Jean Ziegler, is a member of the UN Human Rights Advisory Committee. His verdict is severe. The agriculture of the world could feed 12 billion people with no problem. A child that starves to death now, while we're talking, is being murdered. We looked at the environmental impact of livestock production with regard to uh, climate gas emissions, with regard to water, and with regard to biodiversity. And the aggregate life cycle analysis brings us to about 7.1 gigatons of uh, carbon dioxide equivalent, which at the time was 18% of the total anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. The first part is uh, carbon dioxide, and here the most important uh, factor is the fact that livestock contribute to default in, in, a, in a very meaningful way. About 70% of the deforested land in Latin America is turned into pasture land. The second part is methane. CH4, where the most important emission are the animals themselves. It's coming out from the uh, stomachs of ruminants. A third area is nitrous oxides. Uh, nitrous oxides is a very uh, potent greenhouse gas. It has about 300 times the global warming potential of carbon dioxide, and it is emitted from manure itself again, but also from fertilizer application for the production of feed, which is used for, for the animals. 2006, Dr. Steinfeld co-authored the UN report Livestock's Long Shadow, The Long Shadows of Livestock Production. Thus, the share that the livestock sector alone has in the production of climate-damaging gases became known worldwide for the first time.
Sure. Cow in, in Europe would have um, an emission, a yearly emission, which is comparable to uh, that of a mid-class car. 20,000 liters of water are needed to produce one kilo of meat. 50 square meters of rainforest are irrevocably destroyed. The environmental damage caused by one kilo of meat is comparable to an auto trip of 250 kilometers. In consideration of these facts, environmentalists are demanding that governmental subsidies of meat be stopped. Edmund Haferbeck, scientific advisor to the animal rights organization PETA, has criticized for years that the meat consumption is funded by the state through a lower sales tax on meat. In Germany, for instance, meat products are taxed at only 7% instead of 19%. In addition to this lower sales tax, meat production is encouraged via many, many subsidies. Yes, even additionally promoted. In the European Union alone, over half of its budget is used to subsidize agriculture, and of that, the major part is for livestock production. Many citizens do not agree with the present agriculture policy and voiced their criticism loudly. They want only one thing, money, money, money. They want even more money. So full subsidies should be received only by those who really work ecologically and socially. Germany, with its national agriculture policy, may no longer finance factory farming. That would be the point. Meat is worse than alcohol. Meat is worse than cigarettes. Meat is worse than hard liquor. And that's why, of course, a meat tax should be imposed on meat. People think that meat is a staple food. That is, that it's part of a normal human diet. This is a mistaken belief and a false teaching. And this was even determined by a German high court, which said that meat is not a necessary component of the human diet. Meat is certainly not a foodstuff as such, because it's not needed to live. You can really classify meat as a semi-luxury food, like tobacco or alcohol. The UN Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO, also urged a tax on meat in its 2009 annual report. So it's a possible way of making sure that those who produce and who, um, who, who, whose activities result into environmental damage are held responsible for that damage. Irrespective of this discussion, the climate change advances. Globally, the decade from 2000 to 2009 was by far the warmest ever measured, followed by the 1990s, which, in turn, were warmer than the 1980s. No change is in sight. The fact is that the blue planet is literally being destroyed by meat production. This is scientifically verified, and we have to get away from this, otherwise it won't go on here.
A European consumes about 65 kilograms of meat per year. But what happens before the steak lands on the plate? Edmund Haferbeck describes what goes on in the barns and fattening farms. When you go into these farms, where there are tens of thousands of animals, for instance turkey or chickens, or with pigs several thousand, then you go into such barns, you recognize and see what factory farming or intensive livestock production actually means. We've seen decayed animals in turkey and chicken factory farms lying there between their laying contemporaries. They are simply left lying there and then decay as the weeks go by. Mortality rates are up to 10%, which means animals that simply die off over the course of this fattening period. They simply die away and stay lying there. Animals with open wounds, for instance, in pig fattening farms, open wounds because, of course, they injure themselves on this wooden split flooring. Then there is cannibalism, because out of boredom the animals are constantly nibbling on the tails or the stumps that are left until open wounds develop. We've seen pigs with open prolapsed rectums. No veterinarian goes into such barns and treats these individual animals because it simply doesn't pay. More and more people are campaigning in public for more animal rights, like recently with 22,000 demonstrators in Berlin. This factory farming is one big animal torture, a disgrace, and that people are even offered such meat at all. Things like this. Well, I just have to say I find no words for this. And I am absolutely opposed to foodstuffs being produced industrially, that animals are tortured and animals are merely seen as means to production and not as living beings. So, will factory farming soon belong to the past? The author and journalist Hans Ulrich Grimm doubts this. He has established an information pool on food and health topics and takes a look behind the scenes at the food industry. The truth is that the existing circumstances didn't come about by mistake. Instead, the circumstances are such because many people have an interest in their being this way. When you drive around anywhere in this northern region of Germany where this chicken torture takes place, just have a look at the auto dealers. They have very powerful American Jeets, huge Mercedes dealerships, and so on. So, the people that practice this torture farming are living very well from it. I think it's very important that at some point we stop doing everything just to make a profit. And with foodstuffs, the fun is simply over. They can't give the animals such crap to eat just so that the animal feed industry makes a profit of millions. They are animals and they deserve to be treated just as well as we treat ourselves. Everyone has to start with himself, beginning with buying organic food products, very deliberately. I think the buyer has quite a lot of power. What effects do such calls for action have on the consumer? In the framework of the National Consumer Survey 2 in Germany, circa 70% of those questioned 
said that species-appropriate husbandry is an important criteria for them when shopping. What do supermarket customers have to say about this in our consumer check? Basically, we buy meat solely from our butcher because then we know where it comes from. But does the meat from the butcher around the corner or the meat saleswoman in the little supermarket next door really come from happy animals? In the meat sector, 98% of the meat products available come exclusively from conventional factory farming. Only up to 2% comes from so-called organic livestock production, and that is also intensive animal husbandry, merely somewhat better and with a somewhat different basic feedstuff. But that's all. And that's why everyone should realize that normal meat products come from conventional factory farming. Would people's buying habits change when instead of pictures of happy animals on the package, the drastic reality were pictured? What do you think of such a suggestion? Uh, well, it puts you off, doesn't it? But I think, well, I don't find it appetizing. Yucky, simply disgusting, but then I wouldn't buy it. The chairman of Friends of the Earth Germany, Dr. Hubert Weiger, campaigned for more transparency in the meat sector, saying that the husbandry conditions should be pictured on the etiquette. I think that's right. A picture of the barn they come from. I think that's good, absolutely good. This factory farming is nothing, nothing healthy. It makes the animals sick, and I think the consumer as well. Hidden in the slaughterhouses, the consumer is spared the sight of the efficient killing. Hubert Leibertz was a slaughterman and vividly described the process of slaughtering pigs. The normal course of events, the pigs arrive, are unloaded, go into the stall, then comes a sprinkler system, briefly with gas, done partially in a paternoster lift, the paternoster of death. Back then it was done with a probe, an electroprobe. The pigs were wet down, and then they came in, and were numbed with the probe. That's electrocution. You count to 23. 23 seconds is sufficient. Then the animals were hung up by a hind leg. In the next station, the throats were slit. Two hundred pigs per hour are processed in a medium-sized German slaughterhouse. The workflow is efficient and well-organized. Animal hall, slaughter hall, refrigerated rooms, and intestine processing are directly next to each other. Then comes in the brew machine, where they brewed were. Then they went into the scalding machine, where they were scalded, or in a scalding kettle, so to speak. At the end, they were moved over rollers to remove the bristles. After that, they were scorched with gas flames to singe off the remaining stubbles. Then they were pre-slaughtered, which means hung up, so that they were practically hanging straight down. Now, by both hind legs, that was the so-called spreader, where the legs were spread apart so that they could be gutted better. Before that, the tongues were cut out, and the eyes were cut out, and the auriculas, the external ears. Only then were they gutted. If slaughterhouses were to be opened up, a really considerable number, I would say the majority of the population, would never eat meat again. Because what takes place in the slaughterhouses is horribly gruesome. Open house in the slaughterhouse. 
The manager of a slaughterhouse in southern Germany tries to practice openness, but expressly wants to remain unrecognizable before the camera. Once a year, we have a slaughterhouse party here, a formal family party, in order to acquaint the families with the topic of meat. We hold dismembering demonstrations with cut up half pigs and cow quarters to show the consumer where the cutlet comes from, from which parts the cutlets are made, whereby it makes no sense to introduce the consumer to the topic of killing the animals. That would awaken sensitivities that we don't want to be awakened. The tastiness of meat depends a lot on there being no more blood in the muscles. Normally, people eat muscle meat. And that's why the animal is not completely killed before the slaughter. They talk about numbing. Cells in the cerebrum are destroyed with cattle that's up here in the forehead area. Then it's hung up by the feet, the carotid artery is severed, and the heart then pumps out all the blood. This is very important in the butchering profession, that all the arteries are largely empty of blood. Otherwise, the meat would be nearly inedible. It would be very good for people if they could see what was formerly seen when a steer or a cow had been stabbed. It wasn't a beer mug full or a cola glass full. We could say that it was caskets full. When I was an apprentice, after we had slaughtered two cows, we were standing in blood up to our ankles. Let's just say that with the production of foodstuffs, death is simply a part of life. We are not doing anything unethical or immoral here. We're producing high-quality food for the consumer. Safe, healthy food, and for me, the topic of blood is simply part of the process. When a person has practiced this occupation for some time, his senses are dulled. If he's only on the slaughter line, your feelings simply become deadened. The process of slaughtering, optimized killing, for every worker on the slaughter line. This is a daily reality. When you slaughter pigs, the screaming of the animals, when they look at you, the cows with their big eyes, then there is definitely one or the other time when one says, no, I can't do this any longer. Either you continue doing this now and you end up like most of them, or you stop, and of course, you can see the money that you earned then. It wasn't exactly little. But you have to compensate one way or the other, and most of them then took to the bottle. It used to be that very, very many had alcohol problems. Now and then a cutlet. If I don't know the pig personally, then it's okay. When you eat meat, you don't even think about the fact that it's an animal, or how do you feel when you eat meat? Well, you don't think about it, or only rarely. What do you think about? That you have enough to eat?
Der macht eine gute Musik, aber... It sounds good, but I don't believe it. People tend to repress such things. You can see it on television now and then. And then, people would also have to say to themselves, my goodness, that's one big torture. And what happens? Nothing. And then they go out to eat. They eat a steak. Or go to the french fry stand nearby. Pick up a gyros. Or a hot dog. Is organic meat the way out? At least the label organic promises better conditions and better feed for the animals and less harmful substances in the end product. Particularly after scandals with dioxin or antibiotics, the demand for organic meat increases. Is the conscience being justifiably appeased here? Nevertheless, organic meat is meat. And meat is always a product of living fellow creatures, which, of course, are also killed for this meat production from organically raised animals. We've taken pictures of such rural butcher shops, of organic animals, the so-called organically slaughtered animals, just as in this one. The technique is, however, exactly the same there. There, the conventionally raised pigs and cattle are dragged through using all their technical apparatuses, just like the organic cow or the organic pig. There is no difference. A pig's genetic makeup is 98% the same as a human being's. This is why the animal is interesting for humans as an organ donor. Pigs are considered to be just as intelligent as a three-year-old child. They cry, feel sadness, and fear. So you can certainly not torture animals and then believe that the meat that comes from them is healthy. There is a simple principle, a simple natural law, which we know in the natural sciences. It is, action brings reaction. That is, the law of cause and effect. The animal's death struggle and the fear of death cause an increase of stress hormones in the body. A study from Greece, the Attica study, demonstrated a clear connection between eating meat and fear. There, they investigated the effect eating meat has on the emotional state. And it also demonstrated that eating meat correlates to anxiety levels in women. I experience similar things in my medical practice. Some people report that when they eat a lot of meat, they are more irritable and aggressive. Pain, happiness and unhappiness. Hubert Leibritz came to know them, the animal's feelings. We slaughtered calves. That's always what came at the end. Then I saw a tear on a calf, and I couldn't go on anymore. On the way out, I shook my boss's hand, gave him my instruments, electric apparatus, etc., and said he should send me my papers. I just couldn't continue. Meat is necessary for the life of the butcher, but not for the average population. Many people have meanwhile become aware of the advantages of a vegetarian diet. A study conducted by Emnid from July 2010 showed that 51% of Germans want to eat less meat in the future. This is also the result of many international vegetarian studies, which are carried out particularly in the USA and England, but also in Germany. They show on the average vegetarians have much better health test results. Then there was the famous vegetarian study conducted by the German Cancer Research Center. Over the course of 21 years, they observed the effects of meat consumption. 
And the result was that with increased meat consumption, the mortality rate increased. They are seldom overweight. They seldom have a high cholesterol level. Their blood pressure is in the normal range. Their liver values are better. On the average, everything is better. Someone who wants to change over to a vegetarian diet these days is by no means considered an outsider anymore. Coating with breadcrumbs is done just as usual. Of course, there's the question if one can bread things at all without eggs. And I hope it works for me here because it does work. And what we need? Vegetarian cooking courses are becoming more and more popular, and yet it's hard for many to simply toss their old eating habits overboard. Christoph Mickels encourages his cooking guests. And if you like eating meat, you like a hearty flavor, particularly during the change to a vegetarian diet. That's why sauté your food. Really spice it up. Do with the vegetables what you usually do with meat. I want to show you this here. What gives you that certain something, also with sausage and on the grill, is the crust formation. That's where the flavor comes from. With vegetables, we have the possibility to sauté just as well. We can deep fry. We can bread the veggies. All the paths are open for creating these flavors, which, of course, are not identical, but so similar that I can say, wow, that was really good. It tasted great. It's hearty. And yet, haven't we human beings, as former hunters and gatherers, always eaten meat? It has been determined that during this time, during these 50 million years, we were exclusively plant eaters for at least 45 million years. Fruit, leaves, barks, roots, blossoms, nuts. This is generally agreed on. And, of course, this very long time of development also shaped our anatomy, that is, our body, but also our physiology, our metabolism. If you now compare the typical meat eater in the animal kingdom with the typical plant eater, based on their anatomical and physiological features, and then ask the question, where does the human being fit in better? then it's clearly in the group of the plant eaters, very much so. I've always liked to eat and have eaten well, formerly meat, today vegetarian. In no way has my enjoyment lessened. It works wonderfully. Lexi! Charlie? One and one makes two. Let's go, boys. Hubert Leibertz has also broken the meat habit. Primarily vegetables are on his menu today. Through his new occupation as a dog trainer, he has learned to understand animals. Come here, sweetie. There are farm animals, normal animals, but in my opinion, every animal has feelings and can feel pain. Only an animal cannot express it like a person does, and then it doesn't matter if it's a dog, cat, or mouse, whatever it is. I make no difference there, nor with so-called farm animals, like a cow, a bull, a pig, or whatever you want. He doesn't like to think about his old occupation. I'm very happy that I'm no longer a slaughterer today. I'm happy with what I do. I'm content, and I also feel well. What's with the dog? It has legs. <laughs> but only very short ones. And I can also sleep well nights. <laughs> 